Welcome to Inside IR, a podcast series by Herbert Smith Freehills that explores the latest developments in the Australian industrial relations landscape. Hello and welcome to Inside IR, the Australian Industrial Relations podcast, a series that arms HR, IR and legal professionals with the latest industrial relations thinking. My name's Rowan Doyle, I'm a partner in the Employment and Industrial Relations practice at Herbert Smith Freehills, and you're joining us today for our 17th episode of Inside IR and our first for 2024. And we're very lucky to have joining us today, we've taken a break from the Inside IR couch, we're sort of going to the airwaves now and beaming to you across three different states. We've got joining us in Sydney, partner Shu Jinku, and in Perth, partner Anna Cregan. Welcome, Anna and Shu. Thank you, Rowan. Now, um, many many of our watchers and listeners will, will know both of you very well, for, but for those who don't, we all know Anna, um, you uh, have a broad practice out there in Perth looking after employment, IR and safety with a heavy focus on the mining and resources sector and Shu uh, focus on employment and in particular high stakes employment litigation, including in the financial services and pharmaceutical sectors. So we're very grateful to have you on Inside IR today and looking forward to your insights. And just when we thought it might be safe to return to normal programming on Inside IR, here we are again talking about IR reform. Uh, It's certainly keeping us busy in the IR practice at Herbert Smith Freehills. And we have what I expect to be the last tranche of closing loopholes updates for you. Um, That is going to be the focus of today's episode, the second tranche of closing loopholes reforms, which passed uh, just a week ago at the time of filming, so on the 12th of February 2024. And we also, as part of that process, saw some surprise additions to the second tranche of closing loopholes legislation following negotiations in the Senate. And one of those surprise additions was the new right to disconnect, which you very much looking forward to hearing your analysis on shortly. But before we get into those details, what is in the second tranche of closing loopholes, industrial relations reforms, might just set the scene briefly and take us back, remind our listeners about how we got here. Where did the closing loopholes reforms start from and where have we gotten to? And if we turn our minds back to spring 2023, feels like forever ago now, On the 4th of September 2023, the federal government introduced the first iteration of this bill, Closing Loopholes 2023. And at that time, the bill was really significant. It it ran to about 278 pages, covered 28 distinct parts, and it proposed reforms that are going to have a really significant impact on Australian employers, uh, Australian employers, principals, employees, and contractors. And in many respects, that bill we said at the time was was probably even more impactful than the secure jobs, better pay reforms that we saw passing in December 2022. Now, a lot changed since that point in September 2023, and we certainly saw a lot of lobbying on the employer side, uh, lobbying against the bill. And I think many employer representative bodies perhaps wanted to prevent a reoccurrence of what they saw happen with the secure jobs, better pay reforms. And a lot of time and money was invested in lobbying against that closing loopholes bill. Now, ultimately, not a great deal change as a consequence of that lobbying, unfortunately. And on 7 December 2023, the federal government announced a deal struck with independent senators and the Greens in the Senate to split the bill into two parts. Now, the reason for doing so was to ensure that parts of the bill got advanced passage through Parliament and commenced operation to leave the remainder for debate in 2024. And so what we saw was the first tranche of closing loopholes pass in December 2023. And that included some fairly important reforms, including same job, same pay. It also included the new criminal offence for wage theft and superannuation theft. It also included uh, new workplace delegate rights, fairly significant changes that have now commenced operation, and also some changes to right of entry, among various other things, but they're what I'd describe as, I guess, the top four changes from that first tranche. The remaining parts of the legislation were then split out into a closing loopholes bill number two for debate in Parliament in early 2024. Now, on 8 February 2024, the Senate passed Bill Number 2 with a series of amendments, 
which were then in turn passed by the House of Representatives on the 12th of February 2024. So where we are at today is that we have effectively the entire suite of closing loopholes legislation now through Parliament and uh, operative or shortly operative. And it's the second tranche that we'll be focusing on today. What was included in that second tranche of legislation? Some really important changes. Changes to intractable bargaining powers, provisions relating to multi-enterprise agreements, casual employment changes, changes to the definition of employee, protections and minimum standards for digital, digital la labour platform operators and road transport workers, including some new workplace delegate, delegate rights for them. And as I mentioned, the all-important new right to disconnect. So there's some really significant changes in that, and uh, we'll come to the detail of them shortly, including some tips that Anna and Shu have for how your business might best prepare for these changes. But before we do, one final comment for me on I think these closing loopholes reforms as a collective. We've said it before, but now that they've passed, we'll, we'll say it again. There's five really important impacts of these laws that stand out to me and, and to the HSF people in our team. The first is that they're going to cause compliance costs for business to increase. There's a whole bunch of incredibly complex regulation that's been added to the workplace relations system through these two bills. Various multi-factor tests that need to be deciphered before you know what compliance minimums are. Is a worker a casual? Is, an employee, is a worker an employee or contractor? Is a worker an employee like worker? Is a refusal to respond to contact outside ordinary working hours reasonable? Should the Fair Work Commission make a same job, same pay order? All of those things have really complicated multi-factor tests that the Fair Work Commission or the relevant employer will need to apply to work out what these compliance minimums are. The second point is that you'll see much more of the Fair Work Commission, you'll see much more of the inside of courtrooms, and you'll see much more of lawyers like us. And that's because of the complexity of this regulation and the fact that much of it involves new jurisdiction within the Fair Work Commission and the courts to actually deal with disputes centering around employment entitlements. The third is that some road transport workers and digital labour platform workers will have minimum rights for the first time under the Fair Work Act, and some of them will in fact be participating in collective bargaining for the first time. And these are new jurisdictions and rights that are going to take some time to get used to. The fourth is that unions are back, uh, back very much at the centre of the industrial relations system through the new rights that they've been given to influence workplace conditions. One example of that is the workplace delegate rights that have come through in the first tranche of loopholes reforms. And uh, that just simply gives the unions a much greater capacity to organise the workforce and improve their reach. And then finally, as a consequence of all of this, it's inevitable labour costs are going to increase. It's very much in the design of the legislation. In fact, the government's been very clear in its mantra that they need to get wages moving, so to speak. Almost overnight, many businesses are going to have to rethink engagement of their workers. Is labour hire appropriate anymore? Is contracting appropriate anymore? It doesn't make more sense to actually increase the engagement of direct hire permanent workers. Now, the reason that needs to be considered is, again, that is in the design of the legislation to encourage that kind of thinking, to discourage labour hire, to discourage contractors and discourage non-permanent workforces. There'll also be limited ability to wind back enterprise agreement terms and conditions off the back of these intractable bargaining changes that I'm going to refer to a little bit later. And so employers are just going to find it simply much more difficult to negotiate terms with their workers and it's going to lead to a much greater propensity to make concessions and we're unfortunately going to see a lot more industrial disruption as a result. So these really are some significant impacts. I think Anna Shu, I mean, we're all seeing a lot of interest in these at the board level and senior executive level, and that's for, for good reason, because these impacts will be material. So I think today, though, we're going to focus on that second tranche of changes that are referred to, and we'll kick off with Anna, who will take us through three main points. There'll be the new definition of employment, including a curious opt-out mechanism, which we're looking forward to hearing about, the changes to the sham contracting prohibitions, 
and changes to underpayments, compliance and enforcement. And then we'll move to Shu, who will take us through another uh, important three changes. The first is the new minimum conditions for road transport and digital labour platform workers, so non-employees. The second being changes to casual employment. The third being the all important new right to disconnect. I'll then conclude, wrap things up by referring to some of the changes that impact the enterprise bargaining process. So without further ado, Anna, what can you tell us about the new definition of employment? I have lots to say about that, Rowan, but um, just before I get into that, as I look at you and see the Yarra behind you, I have one burning question for you, which is on my mind, which is, are you going to see Taylor Swift tonight? <laughs> I thought this might be the one meeting for this week where Taylor Swift didn't get mentioned, but no, here, well, here we are. No, I I'm, I'm unfortunately not a Swifty, um, but it I'm seems that everyone that. else in Melbourne is. <laughs> and you're heading down for it, Shu? No, unfortunately not. My kids were heartbroken that we couldn't get tickets, but I think I fall into a large uh, majority of people who tried and failed. Well, jokes on all of us. We seem to be among the only people in our respective offices who aren't going. Half of Perth has flown out for the concert, so um, you might see them over there, Owen. But yes, back to the definition of employment. Um, our listeners will remember the trajectory of uh, the definition of employment. There was over years a definition that was a, a test for determining who was an employer and who was an employee that was developed out of case law. It, it evolved to really have a focus on the facts, the circumstances of the relationship, with a focus on control, but also all of the other various factors that were relevant to employment, the degree of control, whether a person was wearing a uniform, the type of work they did, whether it was specialised, whether they had their own equipment, whether they worked exclusively for one, one organisation or for various. Uh, that was in recent years distilled and, and really, really um, reconsidered in a number of high court authorities that our listeners would be aware of, which effectively did away with that previous test, that previous multifactorial test, and moved towards the primacy of the contract. And th those high court authorities effectively said, you need to focus on what the contract says, how the contract sets out that relationship. You still need to look at all of the various aspects of the relationship, but you need to focus on what the contract says about them. And that is what you should focus on in determining whether a person is a, an employee or an independent contractor. And perhaps unsurprisingly, these laws have unraveled that, have unraveled that recent High Court authority and returned us to the discussion of the, um, or returned us to, to an assessment of uh, all of those various factors which were previously relevant. So it's back to the future, I think, for employers a bit here. These are concepts that, uh, that employers will be familiar with because it's a test that was, has been applied uh, over many years and that employers were perhaps more familiar with than the recent High Court, than the tests that the recent High Court authorities proposed. But the, the Fair Work Act does set out what the test is, it gives some detail there, so that's something for employers to grapple with when they are assessing any form of work and assessing whether or not it does meet the test for employment or whether it can rightly be characterised as something different. Um, so that's something that's quite significant, obviously a very fundamental concept, underscores so much of what we deal with, as you say, Rowan, compliance issues, whether someone's covered by an award, whether they have certain minimum employment entitlements under the Fair Work Act, uh, tax implications, there are a range of different, um, different core employment issues that hang from that. So we do see that as being quite a fundamental shift and one which is obviously key to much of what we do in our area. Um, Sham contracting in the space of talking about employment, uh, employment and contracting is, remains an area of focus. It remains consistent with the government's focus on insecure work, forms of insecure work. Sham contracting uh, is receiving continued attention. What we have here though, interestingly, is a, um, the development of a particular defence for employers who are alleged to have engaged in sham contracting. Um, there's obviously an offence for employers who misrepresent to employees that they are independent contractors, if that's not really the case, and if the employee is, uh, if the individual is actually an employee. But the, these new laws, this bill has introduced a defence for employers who, um, at the time they make a representation to an employee that they are um, that they are um, an independent contractor do so with a reasonable belief that the, in, that the employer was actually an independent contractor. 
Um, so another another slight shift there, perhaps some greater protection for employers if they are representing that individuals are contractors, sorry, rather than employees, uh, but really just some further development of how that framework, how that jurisdiction will be um, can be applied. And perhaps one of the biggest areas of development and ongoing development for our clients is in the under, underpayment space, as you mentioned, Rowan. Compliance issues have been huge for our clients over the, over the past few years, really. Uh, employment is a highly regulated space, as you would know. It's, mo it's regulated by a range of different laws, tax, employment, discrimination, safety. Even within employment, um, there are, are, are a range of different federal and state laws that impact on the entitlements due to employees, leave entitlements, how those things are accrued, how they need to be managed. Uh, and that comes, you know, that, that highly prescriptive compliance uh, regulatory framework come, is now coming with an expanding expectation of, uh, com of uh, compliance and with increased penalties and consequences for non-compliant employers. Um, we saw in the last bill the changes to introduce a criminal offence for wage theft or criminal underpayments that would be prosecuted by the Director of Public Prosecutions and would be, um, would be taken out of that civil penalty, penalties jurisdiction. They would come with a range of different, um, different criminal uh, offences that are connected with the, um, the core offence of the wage theft, the criminal underpayment. That was dealt with in the last bill. What we've seen here in the second part of the split bill is a shift to higher penalties for the civil offence for civil wage theft, for, well, for civil underpayment offences. And those penalties have increased significantly. We've seen those penalties shift um, up to five times what they were previously, which is quite a, significant, um, quite a significant increase and just shows how seriously the lawmakers uh, are taking compliance issues and are taking underpayments and how clear, how clear their expectation is that employers will not underpay individuals and will ensure that payroll is compliant. Um, I mean, obviously there, I mean, Anna, the, the policy intent is to increase the level of focus and attention on compliance with these issues. I mean, that's why you increase the penalties, of course. Um, I know you do a lot of work in, in, uh, with boards and, and uh, in boardrooms. What's your take on whether or not these reforms are achieving that objective? Are you seeing a greater level of attention and focus at the board and senior executive level on wage compliance? Yes, definitely. This is definitely an issue that has hit the board agenda in a way that it perhaps hadn't 10 years ago. It's certainly a, a subject of, um, of uh, a focus for boards and for senior uh, leadership teams. What we are seeing, though, is a disconnect, I think, between HR, payroll, employee relations and legal teams within large organisations who are managing these issues in many cases and who are managing the complexity of these issues and trying to resolve them. And leaders at a board level who are saying, fix this, you need to fix this and you need to fix it quickly. And how can we have, you know, how can we have mistakes in this space? And also we're seeing some questioning in some clients um, along the lines of, is it really this complex? It can't really be the way that you're presenting it to us. This, there must be a simpler solution. And I think that uh, that paradigm really gives us an indication of, as you say, just how complex the, this framework, this compliance framework is and how much is involved in ensuring compliance. Uh, but it's certainly something which has hit the, hit the agenda and has, has attracted the attention of boards in recent years and months in ways that it, I think it previously hadn't. Um, something else which is uh, supporting the focus of boards and senior leadership teams on compliance in payroll is obviously basic ethical issues and, and an expectation by corporations that they wouldn't be underpaying their staff. But also the, um, this, the spate of case law in this, um, in this space, the high number of FOIA prosecutions, the FOIA prosecutions of individuals in, who have been connected with underpayments, and that includes uh, not just offices of some companies where those offices typically have been quite closely involved in an underpayment, so directors, but also in some cases human resources professionals, payroll administrators, others who've been involved in the day-to-day -day administration of underpayments or who failed to correct underpayments on a, at a day-to-day 
uh, business level who have also been prosecuted. And that has shown you know, a, a, particularly, uh, a particular approach by the regulator, the Fair Work Ombudsman, which is really, uh, really seeing businesses across Australia focus sharply on this issue. And, and I suppose, Rowan, just to add something else which is significant in the underpayment space that you know definitely warrants mention is the expansion of right of entry, um, right of entry rights. As you'd know, right of entry is obviously regulated under the Fair Work Act. There are really only three grounds on which an employ on which a union permit holder can enter um, a workplace and only one ground on which a union um, permit holder can enter a workplace without notice, and that is to investigate suspected breaches of safety law. What, these, what this bill does is, in the underpayment space, create another ground, another uh, circumstance where a union permit holder can enter a workplace without notice, and that is if that union permit holder suspects an underpayment and, um, and intends to investigate that underpayment, provided they seek an exemption from the Fair Work Commission to enter without notice. But it is quite meaningful. It, there, there has been a lot of discussion about safety right of entry being the last meaningful form of right of entry because it was the last form of right of entry that could be exercised without notice and, and immediately by union permit holders. This would add another, uh, another form of right of entry that can be exercised without notice to employers. Yes, only where the Fair Work Commission deems that's appropriate and issues a certificate allowing that, but it does expand the scope for right of entry and show also a clear expectation by lawmakers that unions have a role in ensuring uh, that payments are compliant. So that's certainly something of note. Well, a clear message that the focus on compliance is not going to go away anytime soon. So lots of work in that space. Thanks for those updates, Anna. So I think, look, um, important reminder, do have a look at your engagement models for workers. Are they appropriately engaged as employees and contractors? And do you have that engagement right in light of these changes? Uh, and in light of the changes to sham contracting defences? We also I should just mention briefly, there is a new unfair contracts jurisdiction in the Fair Work Commission and also new workplace delegates rights for non-employees. should say all of these topics, including the topics that Anna has spoken to, are covered off in our comprehensive summary of the changes to the second tranche of closing loopholes reforms. If you Google closing loopholes and HSF, that'll pop up. That should be a re useful resource for you. So on that note, I think that brings us to you, Shu, and we're looking forward to hearing from you on the new changes to the regulation of road transport workers and digital labour platform operators. Thanks, Shu. Thanks so much, Rowan. And I mean, the, the key point to take out of all of the stuff that I'm just about to talk about is, it, as you said, it's really starting to bring together the difference between employees and other types of engagements. We are seeing you know, independent contractors, employee-like workers, all of those things are really starting to come together and ultimately be regulated in a similar but not the same way. And that is where there is going to be a lot of disputation, a lot of uncertainty uh, and a lot of time spent in courts and tribunals trying to work out what these provisions mean and how they regulate the relationship between the employer, principal, host, however they're described, and the, taking the most neutral term, worker. Um, so in the road transport industry, what we are going to see is um, machinery provisions that have been set up, which will create an expert panel for the road transport industry and a road transport advisory group that will advise the Fair Work Commission in relation to matters relating to the road transport industry. For those of us in New South Wales who are familiar with Chapter 6 of the Industrial Relations Act, we've got a head start in terms of how this regulation is um, going to operate. What the bill does is at the moment just create the machinery. What will then happen over time is that the Fair Work Commission will make uh, road transport 
contractual chain orders, uh, try saying that three times quickly, um, which will set out standards for uh, road transport contractors. They will have wide coverage across the road transport chain. And so this is going to be an area where I think we will see some uncertainty around what is the scope of these orders, who is covered, who is not, who is inadvertently brought into the coverage of these orders. They are not going to apply to employees, so there's a clear delineation there. But beyond that, I think there's a lot that is going to be um, up for grabs. We're also going to see road transport minimum standard orders which the Fair Work Commission has to take into account before um, making a contractual chain order. So we're going to have two different levels of regulation that are going to come into play um, in this space. Now, what's important with the minimum standards orders is that there will generally be a 12 month period between when they are made and when they come into effect. So that will be important in terms of industry re having time to engage with the processes and make sure that they have the processes in place um, to allow um, them to comply. Now, having two um, different types of arrangements isn't enough. So what we can also have as a third form of agreement is a road transport collective agreement. Now, that sounds awfully familiar, I suspect, to our um, listeners, which is you know, very similar to the enterprise agreements that we have between an employer and an employee. These uh, road transport collective agreements will be what govern the terms and conditions for road transport contractors uh, perform where there's a transport business um, as a party. Here, what is going to be interesting for me is going to be seeing what the scope of these agreements are in terms of who do they cover? How will that be defined? Will it be anybody who engages uh, with the transport business or will there be some other mechanism um, to try and uh, work out who is in and who is out? Having put in place all of those mechanisms, what is then important is what happens in terms of how the engagement of those road transport workers comes to an end. And what we are effectively going to have is an unfair dismissal jurisdiction that will come into place for these individuals. Now, the precise details aren't known, uh, but I think what, as a, as a good guess and a good guide is that road transport businesses will now have to have a valid reason for the termination of a services contract and that the worker was provided with procedural fairness before their engagement was terminated. The Fair Work Commission will have the ability to make an order for a new services contract to be entered into or to re restore lost pay or compensation. Again, for our listeners, very familiar to the unfair dismissal jurisdiction and really narrowing that gap that exists between employees and contractors. Now, the road transport regulation, we've got some time because it's machinery provisions. And now we're going to see minimum standards orders. Um, so another uh, three letter acronym for us to get used to as we see um, how these uh, changes uh, take effect. And these will be for employee-like workers in the gig economy. Now, this is very significant because now for the first time, we are going to have workers who are not employees that are covered by some extensive regulation that will set out minimum terms and conditions of engagement. Rowan, it goes back to that point that you raised right at the start again, that we are seeing Organisations have to think about what is the best way to all arrange their labour and really pushing for perhaps direct um, engagement. 
these provisions around the minimum um, standards orders are intended to apply to workers who do not have a high degree of bargaining power, um, are not comparatively well paid and do not have a significant degree of authority over their work. This is what has been um, put forward in terms of where we have the digital um, labour platform operators as seen as some of the consistent themes that will come through. Now, it's not going to be complete open slather because there are some limitations that are being placed on the Fair Work Commission in making these um, orders, including having re real regard to how the workers um, have their preference in terms of their arrangements, not changing the nature of the engagement from independent contractor to employee. So a recognition that there is this category and they should remain separate, not giving a preference to one form of business model over another and are tailored to the relevant industry and have fact, regard to the fact that the workers perform um, contract, these services contracts uh, for multiple businesses and that that work may be performed um, simultaneously. Now, just like with the um, road transport industry, we are also going to see an unfair deactivation jurisdiction for workers. Again, akin to an unfair dismissal jurisdiction and continues to narrow the gap. Now, what is interesting here though, is that the Fair Work Commission cannot make compensation orders. But what it can do is make orders to restore lost pay if it's appropriate. Now, I think this is very significant because that absence of compensation orders really takes away one of the main things that the Fair Work Commission had in dealing with uh, outcomes where they found unfairness. I think that means there's going to be perhaps a greater desire for the Fair Work Commission towards reactivation and restoring that contractual arrangement because they don't have that same ability to order compensation. However, we'll have to see um, what happens there. Something else that we're going to see is that these di digital labour platform operators can negotiate a collective agreement with an organisation that re represents employees in relation to terms and conditions that they're engaged on. Again, this will seem very familiar to our listeners with the well-established enterprise bargaining framework. But again, it is now pushing into areas uh, that we haven't traditionally seen these types of provisions um, operate. Finally, I mean, overnight, Shu, to, to your point, I mean, the level of compliance and additional regulatory burden in dealing with all these things is is just going to be huge, isn't it? I mean, for organisations that haven't been used to having to deal with this level of regulation for non-employees, I mean, it is, it's, it's going to be a shock, I think, to the system for many. That's right. This is going from zero to 100 uh, very quickly. Mm. They may be brought into a system mm. which they have traditionally have not been involved in and don't quite understand as yet the implications of all of these arrangements. So there is going to be a massive compliance burden that is placed on uh, organisations, but also an educational piece that is going to have to happen. And I think that is something that um, is going to take a lot of work and keep people very busy in just trying to deal with um, the information overload that is coming. because. Speaking of compliance burden, Shu, it's probably a handy segue to casual employment. I mean, there's some similar themes that I think come through in that. What can you tell us about the changes to casuals? Absolutely. And it picks up the, the point that, that Anna made, I think, what, which was traditionally you looked at a number of, a number of factors. Uh, the High Court then said, no, you look at the contract. The contract is king. Now we are going back away to that, as Anna said, back to the future. Uh, we have to have now regard to the totality of uh, the employment relationship. What this means for employers is that this is not a set and forget, and there are a couple of reasons for that, but one of which is that the, um, you have, employers will have to actively consider how often an employee works, whether there is a set pattern 
does the employer have the ability to offer to offer work or not to offer work? Can the employee accept work? These are all specific matters in deciding whether or not someone is a casual employee, is still a casual employee. And we're going to see some really difficult cases in this regard because it is all going to be so fact specific. Um, one change we have or we will see is previously we had a casual conversion process which put the onus on the employer to keep track of things and offer employees the right to be able um, to convert. Now what we are going to see is the onus is being placed on the individual. So the individual will have the ability to issue a notification to their employer saying that they wish to change their status, which then requires the employer to engage with the employee, either in terms of when that change will take effect, will it be full-time, will it be part-time, and those sorts of matters, or to say, actually, no, we don't accept your request and provide reasons for their rejection. Now, this is an individual test. So those organisations that have large cohorts of casual employees, there is a massive administrative burden that is coming down the line, which they need to start thinking about now. And employees will be made aware of these rights because the, there's an obligation on the employer to issue the casual employment information statement when a casual employee starts, as well as on each year anniversary. And that's important, that timing is deliberate because on the anniversary is when the employee can issue their request to be able to change their status. So, and again, it's an individual test. Employee starts on the 1st of January, employee starts on the 2nd of January. The employer has an obligation to provide them on different dates. These provisions don't change the risk for an employer if they misclassify an individual as a casual when they're in fact a um, permanent employee. So those risks still remain. The fact that you issued the information statement doesn't get you out of, um, out of trouble. And the bill also introduces a um, anti-avoidance uh, pr provisions to avoid employers trying to circumvent these. So again, we see very strong um, processes being put in place to really impact the use of casual labour. And it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. When I was looking through the legislation, I noticed that there's a carve out for higher education um, employees who are on fixed and maximum term contracts. I'm a little surprised that that is the category of workers that have managed to be um, exempted. But um, what what will be a, you know, an interesting um, linkage between these provisions and the other provisions that we've seen in terms of the amendments is that, that this ch exclusion will now impact how much universities and higher education institutions can use max term or fixed term contracts because of the changes that have already um, come into place there. One of the topics that everyone has been talking about is this right to, to disconnect. And I think it has got perhaps more airplay than it, it deserves. Um, and I'm not trying to minimise it just because I, I contributed to an article in June 2022 and I said legislative air change in this area was not a high priority for political parties. So I obviously got um, that completely and utterly um, wrong. Sounds like you were straying into editorialising there, Shu. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And what is really interesting about this is this has really captured a lot of attention. Um, and very briefly, there's a right to disconnect will provide a positive right for employees to refuse to monitor, read or respond to contact or attempted contact from an employer outside of their working hours unless that 
refusal is unreasonable. And it extends to contact not just from the employer, but also from third parties. So for example, customers um, and clients. And Rowan, picking up on your point in terms of this is not an easy test that is going to be able to be dealt with. There's a number of factors that have to be taken into account to decide whether or not that contact is unreasonable, including the reason for the contact, the manner at which it occurs, the level of disruption it causes the employee, so a specific subjective test of that employee, the extent to which that employee is compensated to remain available, the nature of their role, the level of responsibility, and the employee's personal circumstances, including family and carer's responsibility. So, so Shu, I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of factors there. I wonder, I mean, question without notice, can you help me with a hypothetical? Let's say, hypothetically, an employer's filming a podcast across three separate states, and you've got a panellist, employee panellist from Sydney, you've got an employee panellist from Perth. Now, we know there's a three-hour three, three time zone difference between Perth and Sydney at the moment. Now, does the employer in that scenario have to film the podcast between 9am and 5pm in each of those states? Asking for a friend. Sure. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll give you my favourite answer. It depends, um, because there are going to be, this, this is, this is you know, a practical example of all of the issues, because it will be different for each of us, because we will have different circumstances. Um, we will, you know, do you have kids? Do you have responsibilities uh, relating to grandparents? What time is it in the, the location? Is it too early? Is it too late? Are you paid to be on, on call? You know, your level of, the level of remuneration takes that um, into account. Have you got other flexibility so that you will start later and finish later? What happens then? The, all of these and things. Shu, Shu, Rowan's question throws up another um, interesting aspect of this change, which is obviously that it, it's, um, it's directed at employees. And as individuals here who are partners and not employees, it obviously has no relevance to us, but it does beg the question when the government's focus has been on secure work and on, on perhaps you might say treating a larger category of individuals as employees than had previously been the case, uh, you know, it, what do we think about the potential for this to be expanded to non-employee workers? Well, there is a review in two years' time, I think, of, of this legislation. <laughs> so not? you've just given the government a brilliant idea as to what will happen. These provisions have been working so well that they should be um, expanded. I mean, there, there, there is going to be lots of issues that arise, but I think they're going to arise at a practical level at the workplace um, because... For a lot, I've really struggled in terms of where exactly is the, the significant problem that this has been coming to provide the solution for. And maybe it has been something that's arisen out of the COVID and the fact that people were working uh, much longer hours and, and in different patterns. And now there is this desire to pick up on what we've seen internationally uh, in other jurisdictions um, such as France and Canada to, to try and have these um, provisions brought in to provide a, you know, a set time frame where people work and then outside of those hours there are ways that people should be compensated if they are going to be in, in contact or required um, to be available. But I think then you, there are going to be issues around that it's an individual test. And so legislation is a, rel is a relatively blunt instrument to achieve this. Uh, and we are going to see uh, disputes that are going to go to the Fair Work Commission. And interestingly, you've got two different ap types of applications. One from the employee saying that the contact is unreasonable and therefore that there should be an order made by the commission that the employer stop that contact. Or the other way around is that the 
employer brings an application and seeks an order that the employee has to um, accept the contact and actually engage um, with this. And the Commission has to de start dealing with a dispute uh, within uh, 14 days of the application being made. Uh, and the final thing, um, a little quirk uh, which has been picked up, is that uh, as the legislation is currently drafted, it's actually a criminal offence um, because it hasn't been exempted from the uh, criminal offence provisions in section 675 of the Act. But the government is committed to fixing that, so a breach of these stop orders will be a civil remedy provision. Thanks, Shu. I mean, this is going to be one of the most interesting areas to watch, I think. And I mean, the, the aspect that I suppose frustrates me the most is that we have yet another reasonableness slash multi-factor test where no one really knows what the precise boundaries are. We just have to wait for the courts and the commission to start educating us all, um, which obviously isn't ideal. But in any event, I'll leave that commentary to one side, um, which I think leaves us with just some bargaining related changes, which I'll briefly cover off. Uh, the minor, more minor changes I won't mention, um, they relate to how to transition from multi-enterprise agreements to single enterprise agreements, how the new model terms in enterprise agreements are to be developed, uh, and some changes to uh, access by franchisees to both the single enterprise agreement and multi-enterprise agreement stream. All of those changes you can review in our comprehensive summary, Google Closing Loopholes and HSF, and that will come up. But the one change I did want to cover off is, in my view, the most significant change of all the Closing Loopholes changes because of the impact that it's going to have on collective bargaining. And that is the changes to the Federal Commission's power in dealing with intractable bargaining. There's been an amendment to the Act through these Closing Loopholes changes that the Fair Work Commission will be prohibited in the context of an intractable bargaining arbitration from, from deciding on a term or condition that undercuts existing terms and conditions in the existing enterprise agreement. So in effect, what that means is employees, unions in the bargaining process will know, they will have comfort that no matter what happens, even if a deal can't be done and the, uh, the bargaining round ends up in the intractable bargaining process, the Fair Work Commission cannot ever arbitrate a condition that undercuts the corresponding condition in the existing EA. Now, the question I pose there is, what incentive does that give employees and unions to make reasonable concessions at the bargaining table? Not much of an incentive to do so. Particularly when you look at the secure jobs, better pay changes that are already in force, you can no longer, it's effectively impossible now to terminate enterprise agreements. And so once you, as an employer, commit to a term and condition in an agreement, it is essentially now there forever, unless and until you convince employees to vote up an alternative. So to give an example, if you have an employer that needs a roster change because they've perhaps introduced some new equipment in their warehouse or factory, and they need to change their rostering system in order to accommodate the operation of that new equipment, if that requires a change to their agreement, then the only way they can secure that change is if they offer sufficient incentive for the employees to say yes and vote up that deal. Who knows what that will cost, but there is actually no other way for the employer to achieve that change. Now, to me, that's a really significant impediment for um, reaching agreement in the enterprise bargaining system. And I think what we're going to see is an even greater length to bargaining rounds, even more of them, kicking into intractable bargaining, uh, a greater propensity for employers to make concessions as well towards the end of that process and ultimately more industrial action. So I think that's uh, in terms of the impact of um, the conduct of parties at the bargaining table, I see this as one of the most significant and perhaps concerning changes through the closing loopholes legislation. And what it really does is flip bargaining on its head. Employers can't approach bargaining in the way that they have done previously. It requires some really nuanced tactics in order to try and address this changed bargaining dynamic. We don't have time to cover them on the episode today, um, but we do touch on some of them in the materials that were made available on our industrial relations hub 
or otherwise feel free to, of course, get in touch with your HSF team member and we'd be more than happy to talk to you about those changes. So there we have it. You're now up to date on closing loopholes. Hopefully that's the last tranche that we have to present on the closing loopholes reforms. And it uh, likely draws to a close what is probably the most significant period of industrial relations form, reform in Australian history. If you aren't already across the closing loopholes amendments, as I said, please check out the very helpful resources that we have available online or get in touch with your HSF contact if you've got any queries. As always, we love to hear feedback on Insider IR, so feel free to comment, direct message, or send us an email at insideir at hsf.com. Otherwise, we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of Inside IR.